All right, thank you for joining us for the first presentation of the conference, DAMS 101. We are happy to be here and be part of this annual conference. In this presentation, we'll go over some basics of dam safety and then provide some updates on the dam safety program in Indiana. To get started, let's answer the question, why do people build dams? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. The main reason people love dams is people love to have a lake. People love to have a uh, good water storage behind the properties and that increases the value. For dams, basically are flood control, purposes flood control, recreation, water storage, power, hydroelectric, farming, and sediment control. Um, DNR do not regulate all of them. Some of them are regulated by uh, the Corp of Engineers, which are federal dams. Other dams are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, known as FERC, that's basically hydropower dams. And those dams are not within those categories that may be or may not be regulated by the state. Okay, so I see people build dams for lots of different reasons. Um, let's make sure we all know what the different parts of a dam are, what the different components are. Sure. Uh, a dam has uh, different components. They may differ from depending on the type of design and the conditions of the, of the site. But the main the main part is if you go from the top, you, you can see all well, the reservoir is the lake. Um, in this case, in this picture, we have a principal spillway in the riser, uh, which is a, a structure that get the water, control the lake water level uh, in on the regular conditions. We have the upstream and downstream slopes, which are the upstream is the slope that goes on the lake, and the downstream slope is the slope goes downstream down down to the dry area. Uh, the crest, which is the part, the top of the of the dam. We have the abutment areas, which are the parts of considered natural ground. The groins are the part of the contact between the magment and that abutment and that natural ground. We have also an uh, emergency spillway down the bottom of the picture. Uh, which controls the water level in, in case of the unusual loads and is designed to control to avoid overtopping of the dam. So we have in this particular dam, we have a stability berm uh, that is a geotechnical par proportion to keep the dam safe on under certain loading conditions. The outlet works, which is the outlet from the principal spillway pipe and the ceiling basin and outlet channel. Well, this is basically same terminology. Uh, we are we have two dams, and in this case, we have a clay core and a compacted field outside. It's a it's a um, hybrid dam. We have a cutoff trench, which is the base to key the dam to the side and avoiding the sliding, the movement of the dam. Uh, the emergency spillway control section, which you know control the water uh, from uh, when when it's overtopping the in that section is activated the spillway. This one has a filter drain that you can see at the bottom, basically located close to the tow area, is uh, controlling the seepage from getting out on the embankment area. All right, thank you, Marco. Here we're gonna zoom in to the upstream side. We're zooming in on the principal spillway riser in this case. So here's some examples of what those look like. And Allison, do you have a cursor available? If you go to that right picture, at the top, you're gonna to see kind of a, a handlebar or a wheel where someone could raise and lower their dam, their, their drawdown valve. As you, as you go down from that wheel, you go vertically down, there's a, a stem that a person would, would go down and then the gate there at the bottom. We do wanna, um, recommend and hazard uh, give you a, a heads up there. You want to be careful and you want to limit limit the use of this uh, dry down gate. We have seen examples where as, as over time, naturally lakes fill up with sediment. And if someone were to try to open this dry down valve or gate, um, it would potentially clog clog that riser. And it's really, really hard to close that, uh, that gate again. So we want to um, caution to you. You want, you want to limit the use of that once, once the dam is initially filled and, and over time it will fill up with sediment. So just uh, be warned there. 
Next on the downstream side, um, as, as uh, water goes vertically down the riser, then it's gonna outlet through this outlet pipe uh, and it's gonna dissipate energy into a stilling basin or a plunge pool. So here's an example of what the outlet might, might look like on some of your dams. On the next, uh, next screen, you are gonna see another uh, outlet works or an outlet impact basin. Um, water is gonna outlet the outlet pipe and energy is gonna be dissipated in the stilling basin, but also incorporates uh, an impact wall, which will uh, dissipate that energy. All right, so those are the kind of basic parts about dams. Um, why should we care whether a dam is safe or not? Sure, that is a good question. And that is, of course, very important. Um, the background image there, I think, is a picture of a Teton uh, dam failure. And if we continue on to the next slide. Yeah, so this is, a, if, if a dam were to be tested, how would it hold up? So in this case, I think this was around 1992, 1993. Um, Southern Indiana got a lot of rain. I wanna say um, over 10 inches of rain, maybe up 12 or 13 inches of rain. And so Allison, if you have your cursor again and hover uh, just below the word principal spillway. So in this case, um, the lake receives so much water, the principal spillway riser, you can't even see it. So it's totally in inundated. And then if you were like riding, uh, riding a uh, raft, if you were down the emergency spillway, so the emergency spillway activated because there was so much water um, that came down to the watershed. Um, one good thing about this dam is that there are no trees on the dam. So we're going to bring that up here in a later slide. You're going to see, um, but, but the good thing as this dam was tested that there aren't trees. So that potentially added to, to some uh, long-term uh, long um, longevity towards the dam. But, but certainly this area received a lot of water and you, you see in the downstream below this dam, uh, things are very inundated. And if a dam were to breach or fail on top of this flooding downstream, there's a, definitely would be a worst case scenario and, add, and really stacking and add a lot of uh, flooding um, impacts that someone would need to consider. And so sure, we're gonna head over to the West Coast. So uh, California, Oroville Dam in February uh, 2017. So I think that the leading up to the conditions of this in California, I think they had a really um, uh, marvelous snow base, but I think snows were melting. And then in California, they also got a large intense rainfall event. And so it greatly, uh, it definitely shows some great examples here of uh, hydraulic, jump, hydraulic jumps, severe erosion, but in essence, the dam is okay, but the uh, Oroville had to evacuate thousands of people downstream because of such a, a intense hydraulic conditions. Yeah, also we have these, uh, um, basically in the notable cans failures in the US, this was a total failure in, in 1889, May 31. Uh, important that that day marks the National Dam Safety Day this is uh this this happens in Jonestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, the estimated fatalities were 2,200 people, and it cost uh, an estimate for 17 million dollars in damages. Yeah, Sylvan Lake Dam. So again, we're still in the 1800s. We're still trying to learn the science about building dams. Uh, what do we do with dams? But unfortunately, there were some uh, fatalities with this. Very unfortunate. Uh, multiple failures. They tried to repair it um, through the 1800s. Uh, then again, look in uh, 1993. So I think that was probably the similar storm event. They had a failure um, uh, failure occur again. So there was emergency lake drawdown that, that had to occur for, uh, for this incident. Well, we have also dams that are in the middle of nowhere um, in forest, forest areas, areas like Bean Blossom Dam. This dam failed in 1993, in November 1993. And you may have thought about that, or you, you may have listened that, uh, oh, this dam is 50 years old, it's been perfect all the time. You have never seen any problems. But uh, just because the dam uh, looks good or it's been around for, for many years, it doesn't mean that the dam is safe. And also you can see some overtopping there. You see how high the lake level got that red line. So that, that dam probably had an over overtopping failure potentially. So yeah, yeah, thank you, Alice. Yeah, so um, yeah, 2008, uh, we had uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 inches of rainfall through central Indiana and some, some lakes and dams are really stressed. Uh, Johnson County, Princess Lakes and Bartholomew County, Lake Schaefer, uh, dams are overtopped. Roads were severely damaged. So it's a really intense uh, storm events. Well, this is another case and it's important. In this case, it's Center, Center Grove uh, Dam in Henry County. Uh, the Henry County Conservancy District uh, and the U.S. Forest Services, uh, they start to discuss 
uh, how to sound downstream downstream of those dams to prevent the development. Sometimes dams are built and people start develop downstream. They don't know about the existence of those dams, putting the, their life at risk. Right, and on the next slide, you're gonna see, I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh, I was just gonna say, I definitely see why we'd want to make sure dams are safe and the danger mm -hmm. if they're not safe. And, and I was wondering, is there a way that we could tell who might be at risk from a potential dam breach? Yeah, yeah, great, yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, yeah, here's an example of um, um, this watershed. Um, they, they do a great job of taking care of the dams. This is a breach flood study. So we're just looking at if this dam were to breach or fail, what could happen downstream? So we look at the potential uh, impacts to homes, roads, and as this uh, breach flood wave continues all the way downstream, you see it potentially could impact the water treatment plant. So this is one of the many tools um, that, that someone that has a high hazard dam they need to incorporate um, into their portfolio. Unfortunately, Marco, I'm not sure if we're hearing you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you. What's the main purpose of our dam of safety of dam program? The main purpose of this is not to the lake owners. Basically, we try to save and keep safe people downstream of the dams. Those are people at risk. So does the DNR regulate all dams? That's a good question. Uh, there are so many dams around the state and around the country. And in, in the state of Indiana, DNR just uh, regulate dams that meet one of all these three criteria, which is the height of the dam has to be 20 feet or above from the original stream bed from the original creek to the top of the dam. The second, con the second condition is the volume in pound. It has to be 100 acre feet in the lake or in the top of the, of the dam. Uh, and the third one is the drainage area above the dam. If the drainage area is one square mile or bigger, the dam is going to be under DNR jurisdiction. But there is a fourth criteria. If somebody downstream considers the dam is, is at a risk for their properties and their life, they can petition DNR uh, with a letter uh, for us to take jurisdiction over that particular dam. Uh, you also do require permits for building dams in Indiana. If, if your dam is going to meet one of the three criteria I mentioned, uh, you probably won't need a permit because it doesn't have one square mile of, uh, of drainage area or it's not in the floodway, but you're still going to need a permit under the dams and levy jurisdictions. The DNR jurisdiction is different than for the Flood Control Act versus Dam Safety Statute. Right? Yes, yes, it's totally okay. different. Um, how are the hazards classified? Is there are there different ways to know how hazard dam could be? Sure, that's a really good question too. <clears throat> we classify dams. Uh, yes. Forward. We have three hazard classifications. The high hazard dams that basically is where a breach of them can cause loss of lives downstream, can cause serious damage to residents on commercial industries building, or let's say a railroad, if it can cut a railroad or major highway for more than 24 hours, it's going to be considered a high hazard dam. Uh, we have also significant hazard dams that can damage isolated homes or highways no more than 24 hours. And can cause temporary interruptions or uh, services. This particular case uh, of dams is gonna be inspected by DNR um, or on, unless the owner wants to, to get a private engineer, a professional engineer to inspect the dams and is expected to be inspected, sorry, uh, every three years. The last one, a low hazard dams that basically can damage uh, farm buildings, agricultural land, or uh, not causing interruption services uh, also, low head dams is another thing we're going to be talking about later. Are typically 
in this category. This dam is inspected every three, every five years by DNR staff. A difference from these two low significant hazards from the high hazard. High hazard dam has to be inspected every two years and the inspection has to be done by a professional engineer hired by the owner. So this is what you can find in, under the duties and the, the powers of the, of the uh, department on the hazard classifications. And this is a brief explanation from what I just mentioned before. Okay, great. Um, so how can I tell whether my dam or any particular dam I'm looking at is safe? Okay, the first thing is you need to work with plans. You need to work with a professional engineer with expertise in dams and dam safety. Uh, the main thing you're gonna find is first the location, and then you're gonna need to set up investigation plan. That means you have to run geotechnicals, you have to do hydraulic analysis, and you have to do a lot of analysis we require for design a, prop a dam properly. That design is gonna uh, uh, work with certain factor safeties. Uh, it's gonna make sure the dam is as safe as possible with the design process. If you see this is a, a area view, kind of the points are uh, boreholes done for this particular design. So after you have everything and working everything with your engineer and you agree with the design, your engineer is gonna meet with DNR on some other local state and federal agencies sometimes need it to move forward with the permits. And that's important. Design options will vary in service depending on the location, the type of dam or the what do you want from your dam. You want your dam for recreational purposes. You want your dam for flood control. You want your dam for any different uh, situations. The design is gonna change. So what if I do want to make changes to my dam or if I want to redesign it? Sure, sure. Yeah, so here's a here's another example. If I have an existing dam, but I need to add a, um, a secondary auxiliary spillway, for instance, we potentially could use a roller compacted concrete spillway or a step spillway. And uh, if you stay tuned right after the break today, you'll hear uh, Josh Gilman talk more about talk more about these RCC spillways. But this is a through the step spillway. It's a, a good way to dissipate energy, another way for flood flows to um, have access to a spillway system without overtopping your dam. And I think there might be a next slide for Labyrinth Weir spillways. Thank you. Yeah, so this is an example in Georgia. So this is uh, this Labyrinth Weir. So if you're limited on infrastructure and you're not able to widen your spillway, kind of left or right, if you will, because of limitations on your site, you can put a, a Labyrinth, Labyrinth spillway. This is kind of an accordion design. And so kind of through the physics of water, um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Here's an example. If you zoom in in uh, Stark County, Indiana on Coontz Lake, you can zoom in and see, um, get a better feel for this accordion design. So through the physics of water and this accordion effect, we're able to pass more water, more flood flows, if you will, kind of through this labyrinth spillway. Yeah, Marco, I might need your help to jump in and help me with these, but I, let's see, I know on the top right, we have a good example of a trash rack to help uh, catch debris, um, something that has a good design. If, if, if things that are inadequate, inadequate and you have uh, potentially poor materials, I, I know we have seen a metal pipe that rust out that uh, can uh, more easily rust versus concrete pipe, or if you have some other examples you can provide to us here in, in these images. Yeah, yeah, that, that's important to consider because if you go with a cheap design, chances are your dam cannot meet the safety criteria. And in if you see your left your left side of the on the screen, uh, you're gonna see these plastic pipes. And basically the pipes you are seeing in the other two pictures are portions of that original pipe uh, downstream, like 400 feet downstream. That pipe is not suited for dams or for this type of embankments. In the other side is a really good design, but you don't want to over design either because if you over design, you're gonna mm -hmm. But you're going to have a safe dam, but you're going to spend a lot of money over. Why, that's why we also, we always recommend working with an engineer. An engineer can develop a plans and he's going to develop a design specific for your dams and for your needs. And it is important, as he said, con construct, just keep moving, con construct for plans. Design engineer should 
oversee the construction. You don't want to get just uh, get rid of a junior, your engineer, and get just a contractor and then cut corners. You know, try to get lower lower money invested because at the end, those cuts are going to create problems on your property and your dam. Okay, so if if I think my dam is adequately constructed, is that all that I need to worry about? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, keeping the dam in well-maintained well maintenance is priority. The life of the dam is maintenance. If you do not maintain the dam, it doesn't matter if you have the best design in the world. It will cause problems. You won't have problems and probably you can have a failure. Hopefully not catastrophic, but yeah, it's, chances are your chances of having a failure is are increased. If you see this dam is totally overgrown with trees, and the safety of this time is, is uh, noticeable lower than the originally was when it was building. So as I mentioned, lack of proper maintenance and repair will compromise the safety of any dam of any structure. So speaking of compromises, yeah, we also want to think about what happens if an emergency does happen. So we need to develop an emergency action plan. Um, and it's certainly required, uh, heavily recommended and required, especially for high hazard dams. But it, it's a way for people to work together, not only the dam owner, but also emergency response um, individuals uh, working with the, with the uh, county and states. We also recommend a tabletop exercise. You would bring everyone together, all the partners that are involved with the dam. So you kind of meet each other, um, have, you, have each other's latest contact information. But through, through these emergency action plans, there was an example on the previous slides about uh, if a dam were to breach or fail, what does a breach inundation area look like? So that incorporates the hydraulics of, of, of a dam failure. What kind of flood wave would happen? How quickly, potentially how quickly would that flood wave move through the valley? And vigilance, yeah, this is important. Yeah, yeah, this, this part is, is vital. Uh, the vigilance and operation maintenance is important because nobody else knows the dam better than you as an owner. Your engineer can know the dam, but your engineer is going to be visiting the dam every two years or every three, or every three years, sorry. Uh, so you have to know your dam and your system. After any storm event is important, you walk the dam and you see if anything has changed. If something happens, something changed or something unusual show up, just record, report, and communicate with your engineer. Your engineer is going to communicate with agencies and with emergency agencies if necessary. And if you need help, reach out. Don't try to solve the problem by yourself. Yeah, speaking of vigilance and working together, yeah, so, so this might, might this be a problem? So through vigilance, a landowner noticed, hey, this is unusual. This dam's been here 30 years, 40 years. Um, it's January. Um, it, it warmed up and then we had a, had a, a, an intense rainfall event. And so somehow there was an unusual um, earth uh, slide on the downstream face. And so pictured here are our staff from NRCS, uh, the owner of the dam, and also uh, con their consultant. We we're able to get it on site right away and take a look at this. Yeah, and after, after a rain event or after any event, it can include earthquake or any non-typical events, yeah, we recommend to look forward. And this is kind of problems you may find. Uh, this is a guide from inspection of dams. Uh, we, we don't inspect, you inspect the dam truly, but at least take a look. And if you see some of the problem, please talk to your engineers. Uh, this one is a low area. The problem with the low area is create a low spot. And in case of elevation of the water elevation, water pool, it can create a path for the water to run through and um, create a possible failure uh, because of overtopping. This is another problem, erosion. Normally, uh, there, you're going to see these gullies. It's water for runoff erosion, normally for rain, uh, poor drainage or not coverage, or poor coverage of from vegetation grass. This is more structural. Longitudinal crack, cracking is more structural. If you see something like that, uh, this is a good, good moment to hold your unit and notify uh, because that may trigger more more problems. There's another type of cracking, transfer cracking. Uh, I think transfer cracking is is uh, could be either a little bit more uh, uh, dangerous because the cracks can go through the, the reservoir and can create a path for the water to flow through the embankment. 
boils, uh, you know, when you have seepage, it's normal having seepage in some dams, uh, but uncontrolled seepage can create these, these uh, boils on the foundation. It means that the water is migrating faster than, than expected, probably beneath the embankment. Right. So yeah, right. Well said. Yeah. So we have to be careful that internal erosion. Um, are we seeing sediment moving through, um, through this internal erosion? Previous picture that talked, we talked about trees and trees can be really detrimental um, on, on the site. Um, yeah. So if a, a tree is there, um, it, it, of course, it's going to look for water, that free attic surface, that water surface that moves through the earthen, earthen and structure, you know, impoundment structure. And so if, if um, internal erosion continues, it's going to, um, uh, get larger and larger. And if you potentially see whirlpool action on the upstream side of your lake, that is something of a great concern. And this is why we heavily uh, recommend you, you keep a, uh, on a quick access list of contacts, you're a, a good solid contractor and your consultant to help you figure out what to do in this case. So this, this is not good. And we certainly, um, if this happens, we also recommend you uh, try to get a pumping system out there. If you want to draw this lake down and uh, minimize the internal erosion, see if you can, if you're able to save your, save your dam. Yeah, so if, uh, when it comes to uh, concrete work, uh, the, the concrete structures on, on your site, in this case, I think this one potentially is superficial. Maybe somebody was mowing the upstream uh, part of your dam and may have accidentally bumped into the, um, the vertical riser. But it's also good to double check. Take pictures of this, uh, check in with the experts to confirm, is this superficial? Or if I expose rebar, is this something we need to repair uh, or look more seriously at this structural damage? Well, oh yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm glad this picture's in here. Yeah, we've seen this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, we've we've seen this. Yeah. So if 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 the lake pool is too high, uh, a lot of times, it just naturally through through our, our lakes and re reservoirs, our, our vertical risers get plugged with debris. And so if the lake pool is is too high for too long, we're going to activate our emergency spillway too often. And I'm assuming that's probably what happened here. That's eroded this emergency spillway, and it's quite a deep cut and it's severe erosion. Uh, is is not good. Yeah, and you need to stop this erosion as soon as possible because that, that cutting can't go through the embankment and, and you don't want that in your dam. Yeah. Okay, so I'm starting to see that owning a dam is an ongoing responsibility. Are there actual requirements for how often to inspect a dam? Yes, uh, the actual requirements, I mentioned those before, but that's important to remember. For high hazard structures, you need to get the dam inspected by a licensed professional engineer every two years, and the report uh, needs to be submitted to IDNR. Uh, if repairs or alterations are needed, the owner needs to uh, perform these maintenance and repairs. If they are just maintenance, you just not notify us through your engineer, and we may proceed without a permit application, but if modifications are needed, you will need a permit application with us. The other two cases that significant uh, low hazard dams, significant hazard dams are inspected by DNR or if the owner wants a, a licensed professional engineer, uh, you can hire him. Uh, under DNR inspections, it's gonna be uh, three, uh, every three years and the fee the DNR charge is $200 for the inspection. For low hazard structures, uh, also inspected by DNR is every five years. If the owner wants an engineer, a private engineer to, to inspect this dam, uh, the minimum is every five years. You want to expect that more uh, in, in low intervals is up to you. And this statutory fee for inspection, the low, low hazard damage is $100. Okay, so that's and it's important. What if it's a question I want to make to, to you, Alison. What if, as an owner, I decide not to complain or not to follow the rules? Well, that's a good question. Unfortunately, something we do have to deal with from time to time. If someone doesn't follow the rules, then they are in violation of the dam safety statute. And this happens when the inspection requirements aren't met or when a dam isn't maintained in a safe state. And when there's a violation, the dams and levees staff in our office will contact the owner of the dam and try to get the violation resolved. If the dams and levees staff aren't successful in getting the owner to bring the dam into compliance, then they will refer the case to the compliance and enforcement section. 
and we will send what's called a notice of violation. Sometimes it's shortened to NOV. A notice of violation is enforceable 30 days after it's received. And if we don't get any response or we don't see any effort uh, from the dam owner to work towards accomplishing the requirements of the notice of violation, then we will refer the case to the Attorney General's Office for referral to the county court for enforcement. We always hope to resolve um, and accomplish compliance before getting to that point, though. We want to work with owners to reach compliance, and we will work with them so long as they're working with us, too. And that brings us to the next point. As you mentioned before, uh, having a dam is like having any other property. It's an ongoing cycle. You have to monitor, you have to keep maintenance. If your dam lacks maintenance, you're gonna have problems and those problems are gonna make all uh, the, the budget just going, just in maintenance and repairs and sometimes reconstruction. It's the best example is like, like a car. You may have a car brand new today but if you don't maintain your car, your car is gonna fail sooner than later. So it's important to keep a good maintenance, good contact with your engineer and good contact with uh, agencies like DNR. So these are some resources and information guidelines we recommend. Uh, those are uh, ASDSOs. ASDSO, uh, you can find a lot of useful information on that. Also, uh, this uh, pocket safety guide from them and Pamets is, is a really useful resource on when you are going outside and you try to look for problems in your properties. Uh, impacts on animals on anything that's also very useful because you're gonna find a lot of animal borders or some other animals on, on your dam that can, that can threaten the safety of your structure. All right, great. And now uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Momita Mukherjee. She's gonna be talking about low head dams. Thanks, Marco. Uh, so Marco has been talking about uh, the traditional safety of dams, emphasizing on structural integrity uh, of dams and the risk to downstream life and property in the event of an incident or failure causing downstream flooding. Now, there is another aspect, safety at dams, which is the recreation safety. And that didn't exist in Indiana prior to 2020. So in 2020, the Indiana uh, General Assembly enacted IC 1427 7.3 to focus safety at low head dams. Next slide, please. So what are the characteristics of a low head dam? Uh, the Lowhead Dam, it spans the entire river channel or stream width. These dams are easily accessible to the general public for fishing and hiking activities. They have a noticeable difference in elevation uh, under normal flow conditions. But during periods of high water, these structures often create dangerous, uh, turbulent and recirculating currents, just like in washing machine. And that can overcome paddled and even motorized watercraft. And these dams also may have a deteriorating structure and foundation. Next slide, please. So what are the salient features of this new law? Uh, the new law focuses uh, attention on public safety at low head dams. So as key safety measures, uh, the law requires the DNR to maintain and periodically update a roster of low head dams uh, that pose safety issues to general public. DNR will establish warning standards, provide public information on low head dam safety, and notify owners of the new requirements. The law requires owners of low head dams to comply with warning standards that will be established by DNR inform DNR of ownership changes, maintain, um, maintain a general liability insurance about 1 million, 
uh, to cover claims from injuries or deaths at the low head dams and also notify DNR of any uh, low head dam damage or breaches. Now, except for inspection, maintenance, or removal of the dam, the law prohibits persons from accessing a low head dam or wading, boating, or swimming within 50 feet of the dam when warning signs are present. And anyone who violates this law commits a class C infraction. So next slide, please. So on May 18th, 2021, uh, the Indiana Natural Resources Commission adopted a non rural policy document, including a roster of 91 regulated low head dams. This roster contains the name of the owners and the location. Uh, as AJ mentioned um, in his opening remarks, yes, we do have a revamped website of uh, the dams and levee safety, and there you will find lots of resources for dam owners. And uh, the, rost uh, the roster is also included there. And uh, the new law, the more public information on safety at low head dams will be posted now and then. Uh, we are also developing a dam breach inundation web app. And now I'm um, giving it over to Garth and who, is, who will give a sneak peek into the new web app. Hi, thank you, Momita. Okay, so I have a quick introduction and a review of a new web app that we're developing for dam breach inundation maps. This app provided through an ArcGIS online web interface will provide the public to view the aerial extent of potential dam failures for dams throughout the state of Indiana. <clears throat> we anticipate availability of this web app by the end of this year. And we are currently working with our internal DNR team to vet this app before publication. <clears throat> Okay, so to move on to the functionality of this app, when you first go to our website, and again, this will be publicly available, the user will encounter a disclaimer, and that's very important for us, uh, that must be agreed to in order to continue. And so you can see with our working template on the right, we have an example of our disclaimer here. Um, that's our work in progress. Next slide. Okay, so once we're through this disclaimer, the user will see the map for the um, entire extent of the state of Indiana. <clears throat> and here you can view the layers available for viewing and mapping. And they're located in this white dialog box. You can check them on and off. <clears throat> so what we've made available is our jurisdictional dam layer. Um, we filtered that to remove low head dams and non-jurisdictional dams. We'll have a dam breach area layer for those dams that have breach areas. The county outlines for the state, which aid with um, just you know locating where you're at. Leaf off imagery over time to assess land changes over time and the changes um, or land use changes over time. There'll be a hillshade topographic layer, a roads layer, and a common place name label layer to help locate um, your point of interest. From the inset on the far right, um, go back one, please. Um, it shows a closer view of the jurisdictional dams layer for an area of the state with a high concentration of dams. And we have them coded as red and blue for those dams without and with with breach maps, respectively. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so now we can start looking at the available information in this app. First, I've selected a dam without a breach map and it's coded as a red point. Um, I can't read the, the name, my screen's pretty small, so maybe the owner's on, on this call. Um, you can see a list of the attributes for the dam it comes up in the dialog box on the far right, um, including the dam name, the state and national ID, the county and watershed names for which the dam is located, whether there's an accompanying breach map. <clears throat> now, when you select a blue point, go ahead and uh, next advance. Thank you. Uh, the attribute information changes and it confirms that there's a breach map for this point um, that's visible at the bottom with a Y for yes and no. And we can then select a breach polygon area. So next slide, there we go. Um, and it's color coded to be semi-transparent blue. Once selected, the outline of the polygon of interest becomes visible and the attribute information is displayed in the dialog box. For each breach area, there's a dam name and a state ID, the date created in the author, a simple method description, the county name that it's located in, the counties impacted, 
and the area of the inundation polygon in acres. And lastly, the user is encouraged to just click around. So if you advance one more, yep, um, you can better understand and get a feel for what information is available. So it's about getting in there and exploring. Next slide, please. So here uh, we just have some basic tools that we've made available to improve the functionality of this web app. Uh, first, there's an option to return to the prior view. You can see it here. So if you close the app, it'll you have the option to return to your prior extent. Uh, next. Yep, we have an introductory description and directions on how to use the tools to uh, help the user uh, through using this web app. Next. We're also providing annotation tools for marking up a map. Here showing a polygon I drew with a note about its acreage. So if you get into an area you want to write some notes on, you can, and then send that out to somebody. We're also providing annotation. Oh, um, uh, excuse me, next slide, please. <clears throat> yep, there will also be measurement tools for extracting distance, area, and point coordinates. Uh, so polygons, straight lines, and you can get your X, Y coordinates if you want to know where something is located. Next, then we can go, we have print to PDF options. So you can do your markups and your extent of interest and then print that map and save it and send it um, for whoever you like. And next slide. So here, this is a pretty cool tool. It's fun to play with. It's a swipe tool and you can, um, it allows the user to seamlessly transition between layers for comparing content. So Allison, if you kind of go back and forth a couple of times, Yep, just like that. You can see it shows the same area with and without a breach layer. You can also turn imagery on and off um, to see changes over time if you like. And last, uh, so if we just advance to my final slide, uh, we'll have, there's also this tool to share. So whatever you're looking at, you can send that to another party uh, via email or there's probably social media options there are in there too. And so that's a sneak peek. We're working on finishing this, uh, like I said, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, so next slide. And um, so we're ready for questions for me and anyone else on the dam safety team and Chris and Allison, and we appreciate it. Thank you. I think I saw one question in there already. Patoka and Monroe, not yet. <laughs> Um, and that's going to be um, most likely in our federal representative here could maybe speak better to that, but I would anticipate that would be something that if and when it becomes available to be through the Corps of Engineers, not through us. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, we still have more minutes for questions. Um, so we think we had a few put in through the, um, through the chat. Um, so as a reminder, um, you can always type in a question there during the presentation at any point, and we'll try to get to those um, during the question time. But then you can also, um, if you'd prefer to ask the question, you can unmute yourself um, and ask the question. We have a, we have a few more minutes to, to field some of those if anybody has any. Yeah, I put the cart before the horse a little bit there. Sorry, Bregan. Uh, we did get a question. Will the dam breach inundation web app include larger reservoirs such as Patoka or Monroe Reservoir? Like I said, I don't anticipate that being made available on our end. If and when it were to become available, that would be through a federal entity who is um, owns and operates those dams like the Corps of Engineers. <clears throat> okay, it looks like we have another one. Um, the question is, are there grants available for private lakes for homeowners that can't afford a multi-million dollar repair? or allow for a sale of the property to preserve a large body of water? Let me take that. Um, yeah, so there are no grants available for private lakes, uh, but there are some FEMA grants, the HHPD grant, but you have to be eligible to receive that grant. And there are more details available on the website. This is Chris. I know back in 2008, when we had severe flooding throughout Indiana, um, some of the uh, dams, some of the owners around some dams created a conservancy district, and you're able to do that through Indiana DNR. And so that way you're able to group uh, your resources and your funds and create a taxing authority that is set up through the county and also housed by Indiana DNR. And, and so th that way, sometimes you're able to uh, levy, um, 
levy funds uh, together as, a, as an owner um, or multiple owners around a dam. So sometimes uh, if, that's a, if that's available to you, in this case, that, that might be an opportunity to try. Chris, uh, this is Justin Clear. Would, would that would forming that con, uh, that conservancy group or that conservancy district require that you start dealing under PL five sixty six? That's usually the conservancy districts or whatever it is for your state. Um, in Ohio, I think it might be the same name. I th it's usually set up within the county, so it's kind of a, a state and county um, uh, is the avenue you would go under. So that's kind of its own um, its own piece. But yeah, you, you would be able to reach out to the county or, or the, the state to kind of start that process. Probably the, um, I'm gonna reach out to Ohio DNR, I think Justin, and, and see what they could do for you if you have an example there. Okay, and um, Mamita, I don't know if you see there was a little a follow on to the previous question about um, being unable to afford a multi-million dollar repair. And so the, the follow on to that was so if a person can't sell their property um, due to the risk of a dam, what are their options um, for the person that's gonna acquire that property if, if there are any? Okay, I can take care of that. Uh, yeah, basically if you have always options, one is removal of dam, decommission or repair. For any, any of those uh, uh, situations, you're gonna need to fill up a, a file a permit with us and with some other agencies. Get an engineer, get options on the table, and move forward with that. Okay, thank you, Marco. Uh, but I think this will be the last uh, last. One. We have time for one more quick one here. Um, this is from Paul Davis. Has the Division of Water ever required that a non-compliant dam owner sell the property on which the dam resides, or require the demolition of the dam? Well. Uh... From my experience and understanding, after a long liability, pro a long uh, legal pro process with courts and uh, a lot of you know legal issues, uh, if the owner is not in compliance with our regulations, you can either uh, be required to either remove the dam or repair it to a safe state or lower the dam. There are many, many options, but it's that on the legal end. Okay. Yeah, and we wouldn't require that a property owner sells the property as, as part of that. It's just all about making sure people downstream are safe. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. That uh, concludes our time, and we're going to move on to the next uh, presentation. That was very, very informative.